It's Thursday, October 11th, and I'm your host, Paula Hersey. On today's show, we go back to school to learn more about the Cape Cod Collaborative and go underground with Hyannis Water Supervisor Hans Kaiser. First up, some news you can use. Inside Barnstable Town Government is enrolling now. The 26th session of the Citizens Academy will be held again beginning Tuesday, January 29th. Enroll now to avoid the waiting list. This is an 11-week commitment on Tuesday nights from 6.30 to 9 p.m. at various town departments and locations. Get an application at the town manager's office or call 508-862-4610. Established in 1975, the Cape Cod Collaborative provides, as an interdependent collaboration of public school communities, a flexible, evolving range of high-quality, cost-effective programs and services to Cape and Island school districts, including Barnstable. Executive Director Paul Hilton joined us in studio to tell us more about the organization. With me today, Paul Hilton from Cape Cod Collaborative. We are going to discuss what the Cape Cod Collaborative is and how it helps Barnstable school systems. Paul, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. So executive director of an organization that's been around for a long, long time. We see the buses all the time, but we're sometimes not sure exactly what you do. So give us a history of the collaborative. Sure. Um, first, the collaborative does a little bit of everything, and what we do changes year to year. Uh, but the collaborative started in 1975 when the communities on Cape Cod and the islands uh, came together and, and organized to, to meet the challenges associated with um, changes in educational law and, and mental health law across the state uh, where students were entitled to more education in the school system than they had been previously. Uh, so the collaborative uh, worked um, on behalf of all the school committees on the Cape and Islands to develop programs for what we call low incidence populations uh, where students with unique challenges, uh, maybe one or two or three in each town, uh, you couldn't staff appropriately to meet their needs. Uh, so the school committees formed a collaborative so that they could serve those students together on a regional basis. So we've been a, a regional entity that meets the needs of the students um, on behalf of the school districts and the families uh, throughout the region since 1975. Okay, so how does this uh, organization form? Is it an advisory board or is it a, a closely knit organization that you guys make decisions? How does it work? Sure, um, well technically the 19 School committees uh, that comprise the collaborative own the collaborative. We're part of each of the municipalities. Um, okay. I think we've been told we're an instrument of each of our member municipalities is the technical term. And as such, uh, we do unique things uh, and work with each of the districts to do things uh, to help support them, to strengthen and support their programs, as well as to develop programs uh, that may meet oncoming challenges as they arise. So that's interesting. So all of the uh, school committees put forth a person who sits on the board. Yes. And when people have ideas or uh, the collaborative is doing something, does that information then get shared out to other uh, districts? Um, yes, uh, we have 19 members of our board meet uh, the second Wednesday of every month uh, to talk about what we're doing in the collaborative. Uh, but the collaborative also has many advisory groups. Uh, we have an advisory group of superintendents, an advisory group of special education directors, an advisory group of business managers, an advisory group of facility directors. Um, and we bring people together to help look at what's happening currently and what's evolving so that we can help uh, meet the challenges that schools are confronted with year to year. So as professionals, how important it is for just superintendents to meet? You gotta figure that you know, you're top of the food chain there mm -hmm. and having peers to talk with about mm -hmm. things that are happening in your district, is that a good a uh, fair way to say that? I, I believe every superintendent uh, works to meet the needs of their community. Uh, they meet independently uh, and have a group and I attend that group to make sure that I'm eliciting from them uh, information that helps us meet the challenges that are arising regionally, uh, but also share with them the things that are happening within the collaborative. Um, our collaborative is made up of school committee members, other collaboratives are made up of superintendents. So we try to create the symbiosis that information is coming and going from the collaborative um, at all levels. Um, in many ways, we feel like we have 99 bosses. <laughs> That's a, a <laughs> municipal government. Um, <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about 
the programs of the collaborative. Um, I had mentioned the bus program, mm -hmm. um, but there's lots of things that the collaborative does for all sorts of different districts. Sure, I think the best way may be to explain back to the history of the collaborative. Sure. An example that's often used is for students with unique challenges such as students uh, with uh, intellectual disabilities. Um, uh, back in the 1970s were served um, uh, initially in districts but then in collaboratives where you could have more effective um, instruction for some of uh, the populations of students when you um, were able to meet them at grade level and at performance level on a regional basis and bring more resources to bear. Uh, also, as you were in the 1970s, we had a uh, large population of students with visual challenges and hearing difficulties. Uh, at different points in time, the collaborative had very large classes um, or very large programs with deaf and hard of hearing or visually impaired populations of 40 to 60 students uh, with cognitive disabilities uh, somewhat significant. Uh, as the collaborative worked with the districts and the districts developed their own programs, the populations were more effectively served in the districts with support services. Uh, but as you came into the 1980s, 1990s, students uh, with autism became a challenge that um, were difficult for districts to initially meet in the collaborative developed programs initially to work with those students, but also to support those students in districts. Um, and as districts progressed and programs developed, the collaborative population shifted. Uh, and we continue to serve more low incidence, but it tends to be more intense special needs. Uh, and programs for students with unique challenges uh, that can be more effectively served when the resources are pooled by the districts. And the collaborative being owned by all the districts is a unique place for the for districts to pool their resources to run effective programs. That's so interesting. And talk about, what, uh, I believe it's the Challenger program? Uh, the Challenger program is a social and recreational programming that is co-located with the collaborative. Right. Uh, it's a nonprofit that uh, was founded by um, uh, Amy Lipkind and Kelvin Eng, a couple uh, from Sandwich. Uh, and when we moved to the Austerville Elementary School, we moved one of our programs and um, they used the building uh, afternoons and weekends to run special programs. And uh, it was a great symbiosis uh, with a nonprofit serving a similar population to the populations that the collaborative serves in some of the programs. That's amazing. When we look at the collaborative, and we know that now, because you're helping mm -hmm. us to understand that it's really town and district wide and region wide. Mm -hmm. What are some of the initiatives this past year through your annual report that you want to highlight so people really understand? I know there's a lot in that <laughs> <laughs> document. We won't sure. go but page I, by I page. Know. But what are some of those things that you'd like to highlight for residents here in Barnes? Sure. Um, districts are doing an amazing job on Cape Cod meeting the needs of, of the students. And um, Cape Cod is very, uh, very lucky to have the number of resources committed to students that they do. And on the Cape, the Collaborative runs two public day special education programs, uh, one in Austerville and one in Sandwich. And, and these two programs serve unique populations um, that are, have unique challenges uh, in their education. And we have 50 to 60, 65 students at each of the sites uh, with very intense staffing. Um, those programs, um, the STAR program in Austerville was started in 19, uh, 2010 uh, after community-based, school-based programs. Um, the population was too intense for those uh, settings. And our Waypoint Academy is our alternative education program, which was started in the year 2000 uh, on the uh, former Naval uh, the Air Force Base uh, and recently moved from the Otis Memorial School to the Wing School in Sandwich. Uh, those are two of the primary special education programs. But among the things we're doing more often now are, um, is a municipal government, not a company and not a nonprofit, our goal is to finish at zero dollars every year. And uh, we strive to do that every year, and uh, sometimes we come close, sometimes we don't. And uh, we've been doing more and more general education transportation, partly because the schools need the flexibility of deploying the resources in manners that they see appropriate. Uh, so that seems to be a very evolving area. Many people in Barnstable and on Cape Cod may be behind a Cape Cod collaborative bus or van on occasion. Uh, we have a rather large fleet. But our goal is to meet the needs of the students, the families, and the districts in a very flexible and nimble way uh, and to be cost effective and efficient in what we do. So if we run 100 vehicles, we want to finish at zero. And if we finish, run 10 vehicles, we want to finish at zero. We also run a um, residential gifted and talented program 
uh, at Mass Maritime every summer. And this coming summer will be our 15th summer. And uh, it started 15 summers ago with Dr. Joe Gilbert, who's a former superintendent from Harwich. Uh, and integral at that time was Admiral Gernon, who was the president of Mass Maritime, and Fran McDonald, who was the current president yeah. of Mass Maritime. Uh, and Fran uh, was instrumental in working with Dr. Gilbert uh, to develop that program. And uh, it's been very sustainable and growing since that time. Uh, we'll continue to look at that program and uh, try to expand it and develop it uh, to the extent we is possible to support those students. Uh, we've also um, worked with districts on grant initiatives. We have a special career and vocational programming for students that aren't able to get to the tech schools, um, partly due to circumstance uh, when they move into town or it may be due to their um, capacity to maintain their enrollment in school. So we're working at integrating vocational opportunities for students with grant activities. Uh, we're looking with uh, district support. Um, we have a program, a grant initiative that we've been running. This is the third year, and we're looking at three more years to help support the superintendents and the leadership within districts in developing uh, their internal capacity to manage change and to manage instruction uh, going forward. Uh, so they're very strong resources uh, in the districts, but we want to make sure that they're sustainable, and we work with the districts to pool the capacity uh, to, to support them going forward. Um, I can keep on yeah, going yeah. or I can <laughs> stop, uh, but uh, uh, among other things we've done, uh, very interesting is we're now um, working with some international programming and, and matching some international groups uh, with the districts in terms of uh, students visiting from abroad and students going from districts on, on uh, Cape Cod and creating partnerships that are sustainable. Uh, some districts have great partnerships already, uh, but we're looking at uh, developing and, and sustaining uh, relationships with some of the districts that haven't. Yeah. Well, this, uh, like uh, alluded to in our beginning, is that it's not going to be our last conversation because <laughs> there's just so much going on at the collaborative. But if you could briefly tell us, what are some of the initiatives for this new academic year as we just started it? Um, you know, the collaborative uh, is, is such an integral part now of our school systems. Mm -hmm. What's on the horizon? Um, well, I'd say first and foremost, every year has a new horizon for the collaborative. Uh, we're always working with districts to identify uh, things as they happen and as they evolve. Uh, you uh, mentioned transportation, and I'll mention transportation, that that will continue to be an area uh, that we see a lot of development. For programming for students, uh, we're looking to reevaluate and, and uh, reinitiate some investment in our summer program for the students that are gifted and talented. Um, uh, in the middle school, but also on a regional basis. Uh, we're looking at a current grant opportunity uh, for leadership development within districts on behalf of the districts that are involved. Uh, and we'll continue to work with all of our um, advisory groups, uh, whether they be uh, superintendents, uh, special education directors, curriculum directors, or business managers, in terms of developing uh, grant programming or shared professional development uh, to, um, to meet the needs of the districts as they exist currently and as they exist going forward. How can people learn more about your organization? Uh, we have a website that we're going to continue to develop, speaking mm -hmm. of initiatives. Uh, we publish an annual report every year that gives a bird's eye view of the things we're doing. Uh, and um, people can listen to their school committee meetings. Some of their board representation may give a quick update regarding the collaborative. Right. Or, or they can really look onto the website and get more information about the programming that's offered. And that website address? Is uh, capecodcollaborative.org. Uh, well, that was Simple but easy. long. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Paul. We really enjoyed uh, learning more about this important organization and especially that all of our region is collaborating. Yes. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right. Take care. Miles of pipe underground that is almost 100 years old. Emerging contaminants of concern and rising costs to maintain the water supply. Hans Kaiser, supervisor for the Water Supply Division, met us on the east, east end of Main Street in Hyannis to talk about the 30-year plan of water main replacement. I'm with Hans Kaiser, Hyannis Water Supervisor, out on a construction site here on the east end of Main Street. Hans, what are you doing here today? Um, what we're doing is uh, cleaning and lining a 1911 water main. Um, and this job goes from Barnstable Road to School Street. Um, what we're doing, we are uh, 
right now installing a temporary water service um, so that during construction all customers are still going to be serviced and we have fire protection for them. Um, as soon as this, this temporary water main is installed and flushed out and tested and made sure it's safe, the water is safe, what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll disconnect the 1911 main, the 12 inch main that's, that's four or five feet down in the ground in Main Street and start uh, cleaning it out, uh, draining it, cleaning it out. It's going to be all scraped down and then what we'll do is we'll do a, a little layer of cement on the inside. We uh, replace all the valves, we replace all the services to people's properties um, and we change all the hydrants out, uh, brand new fire hydrants. And we've been doing this type of work also on West Main Street. Um, we did C Street. Um, we're basically, um, in a structured way, measured way, we go through the, uh, the village of Hyannis and, and take care of um, uh, the water mains. You know, if they need to be replaced, we replace them. If you know, the quality and the size is, is still good, if the pipe is still good, we'll just clean and line them. And uh, we're moving through the village that way. It's a 30-year um, pipe replacement and upgrade program. Um, we spend a little bit over a million dollars a year and we do roughly about a mile, mile and a half every year. Um, last year we worked together with Mass DOT on uh, the Route 28 uh, Beersus Way intersection and uh, now we do um, Main Street in this area. Uh, next year we're planning to continue this job and um, to go from School Street to the Yarmouth Town Line. Um, and hopefully by that time after that job is done, we'll be ready to work together with Mass DOT on the Route 28 Yarmouth Road intersection, right where the CAM Appliance store is. That, that's, that intersection is scheduled to uh, be redone. Okay. I have a question for you. You're dealing with over a hundred year old lines here. That must make your job really difficult. Um, I would say it makes it challenging. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we have we have uh, plenty of um, of interesting issues to deal with. We have very old valves. Sometimes they're not accessible. Sometimes they have um, operating nuts that are rounded instead of square, and so we need to use and purchase special tools to replace them. Um, Sometimes you have to actually excavate them and just um, replace the valves. But you know that's five, six thousand dollars per valve, and if you can replace the nut and make it work for you know a couple hundred bucks, it's it's quite a savings. So uh, uh, that way we we can get a lot done with with, with less money. Right. We're constantly are, are aware of that. The pipes themselves, are, are, is there some type of degradation to those pipes over, the, over time? Yes, there is. Um, and actually, especially from the outside in, because uh, here on, on Cape Cod we have you know, sandy soils, and most of the time the, the, the groundwater here has a very low pH, very acidy. So what happens, especially with the older pipes, is that they actually um, deteriorate from the outside in um, and um, you'll probably see some uh, some examples of that pretty soon. Um, besides that there's nothing else you can do about that than to basically replace the pipe. Um, one of those situations happened on in 6th Ave a couple of weeks ago in West Hyannis Port and uh, we just have to replace two blocks of, of water main which probably will happen this spring. Okay, so when we talk about you know pipes and valves and things like that, the underlying issue here is water quality and, and yes. water quality for our residents and our businesses. What other things are facing you as a water department supervisor that really kind of you want residents to know about water quality? Um, besides the usual issues with bacteria and iron and manganese, which is pretty standard here on Cape Cod. Um, there's you know, issues with emerging contaminants. Uh, we're dealing with, we have been dealing in Hyannis with 
the PFAS PFOA situation, uh, you know, basically caused by the Barnstable Fire Fire Training Academy, uh, the, the, the firefighting firms. Uh, but besides that, we also have issues with uh, another emerging contaminant, 1.4 dioxane, uh, which is basically, or used to be in everything that basically had bubbles, uh, including Tide, uh, laundry detergents, etc. Um, so to be able to deal with those issues, um, we really have to install some fairly advanced water treatment systems. Uh, we did that already uh, with the activated carbon filtration systems uh, up at Mary Dunn. And right now we're um, finishing up the design and starting construction on a, a $12 million plant uh, at the Maha filtration plant. And we are right now exploring and looking at the Hyanna Sports Straightway area, uh, what the best solution is for that area. And there's multiple options that we need to work through those. Besides that we're looking also at, um, at um, new wells and new sources as, um, as an option but that, that's a long-term project that's seven to ten years out you know, by the time uh, you do all the permitting, you get everybody involved, you get the design done. It's, it's a long-term process. Right. So if Residents can think of water quality as a layer cake. What are some of those layers that residents really should be concerned about or should look for the town to solve or to be proactive with? Um, there's a whole bunch of layers. Um, you know, first of all, it, it's drinking water, so it's a public health issue. Uh, second of all, it is a fire flow issue. We need to have enough volume and pressure of water to be able to uh, fight fires all over town. Um, of course you have the bacterial and virus issues and, and um, in Hyannis we do chlorinate which helps that, takes care of that issue. You have of course the iron and manganese issue. Uh, right now we're doing uh, sequestering but we're looking at um, green sand filtration to actually remove the iron and manganese. Um, that's part of the, the, the new filtration plant in Maha. Um, besides that, you have the emerging contaminants issue. Um, the PFOS PFOA gets taken out by the um, carbon filtration systems. And then the 1.4 dioxin, the only way you can, that's a very tough chemical to get out. Uh, that basically gets out by advanced oxidation with peroxide and then ultraviolet uh, treatment of the water. Um, issues that residents can deal with is actually right now we would love to have uh, one of the ratepayers in Hyann as a resident uh, to, uh, to help us. There's an, an opening on the Hyann's water board that needs to be filled. So, Anybody that's willing to, um, to spend at least two hours every month um, attending the water board meetings and, and get to know in, in more depth what we do and help us make decisions, it's appreciated. Um, and even attending the board meeting and learning about the details uh, would help. Um, besides that, yeah, get involved with local boards. Um, the whole new sewering issue, the coastal embayment issues, it's all related and it's all part of it. The other part is the, uh, the financial piece. We need to be able to afford what we're doing, which is quite a struggle right now. Um, this, you know, my filtration plan is $12 million and you know, how fair is it to have ratepayers come up with all the money when somebody else um, contaminated the water and you know and, and get involved in that way. Um, there's issues with um, zoning and enforcement of zoning um, that could be improved in my opinion. Um, there's, there's multiple layers. Uh, the other issue is um, if you have leftover medication to not flush it down the toilet because that ends up right in the groundwater. Um, you know, via the sewer plant. So, so 
basically day to day, every day issues that you deal with. Uh, it's important. Right. So I'm going to finish with this. Uh, Cape Cod is located on one single source of water. We call it a single source aquifer. Yes. How important is collaboration between watersheds? Well, I can answer that uh, fairly easy. I'd say it's, it's, uh, it's very important because groundwater flows underground. It doesn't care where you are. Uh, it crosses boundaries, town boundaries, um, and it will go in and out of the ponds. Um, I would say collaboration is, is, is critical. That's the only way you're going to resolve it. And uh, you have to try and keep diligent constantly because there's constant um, pressure put on drinking water and, and uses of land that's not appropriate. And especially also the grandfathering of certain land uses really needs to be addressed. Here's a look at our community calendar. Come connect, be inspired, and exchange ideas on October 19th at the Tilden Arts Center at Cape Cod Community College starting at 8 a.m. The 2018 Creative Exchange highlights artists in every medium, including writers, performing artists, and visual artists, and features outstanding speakers on an array of topics, all as well as plenty of time for networking. Many past attendees have great stories about the connections they've made at the Creative Exchange. Check out the lineup and panelists for 2018 and learn more or register at www.artsfoundation.org. Comments, suggestions, accolades? Connect with us on Facebook and Instagram. Email us or send us an old-fashioned note by Carrier Pigeon. Channel 18 works for you. I'm Paula Hersey, and thank you for watching Barnstable today. Music